to this morning. Amen. Amen. God wants you to flourish in the face of famine. Amen. Amen. And so the topic today is flourishing in the face of famine. Really, the Joseph principle. We're going to examine uh, Joseph in the Bible. And he's probably one of the most inspiring characters in the Bible for me to study. Uh, before we do, let's do a quick review of some of the key areas we've studied out in Genesis. Yeah. We're, from all the way back, we studied out Adam and Eve. And the title of that message is, Would You Be Satisfied with Paradise? You remember that? Yeah. Would you be satisfied? Adam and Eve were in paradise! And they weren't even satisfied there. Yeah. That's why they listened to Satan and got led astray. Right. And so for us, we got to watch out for dissatisfaction. Are you with me? Dissatisfaction with what God has given us can make us vulnerable. Vulnerable to temptation and cause us to stop trusting God's plan in our life. Um, what's another one we looked at? We looked at Noah, right? Uh, I think the title here was, Would God have chosen you to build the ark? Would God have chosen you to build the ark? Right? And just thinking, wow, Noah, this guy, to be able to take a stand against everybody else. And all the persecution, people are looking at him weird, like, why are you building this boat? What is wrong with you? Yeah. Right? That was a huge risk. And funny enough, while he was building the boat, he was actually preaching the word too. Yeah. We see that in Peter, right? So that, that was huge too. Being a risk taker, obeying God no matter what his request is, yeah. is crucial to being used by him. Uh, another one, another topic we looked at, the Tower of Babel, right? Are you speaking God's language? Are you speaking God's language? Is God, are, are you able to be a mouthpiece for God? Or does God's word come through you and stop? And all of a sudden you start watering down what God actually wants to say to the world. Are you with me here? We want a people please versus saying what needs to be said in love. And speaking the truth in love. The question is whether we're working for God's glory or our own. Um, Abraham, right? The faith to wait, right? And to believe that God will use our patience. From one man came a nation. I mean, that, 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 God wants to not just give us a physical nation, because some of us may or may not have kids. But God wants to use you to literally have spiritual children. And has it been amazing to see all the spiritual children who have come to know Christ? Actually, if, if you've been baptized into Christ since the mission team came here, stand on up. Stand on up. If you've been baptized into Christ since the mission team came here, stand on up. Is that possible? Please sit down. Yes. To God be the glory. That's like a little bit of church right there. Folks are away on Christmas break and whatnot, cameras with their families, but it's amazing. With 11 on the mission team, a handful here on the ground in the remnant group, now God has multiplied average from 11 to almost 70 disciples. Yeah. And even today, there, there are two that are very close to baptism. we got to continue praying for Moses and also for Abigail. Yeah. Amen. So, but it's, it's just so encouraging to see what God is doing. It's also encouraging to have our dear brother and sister Joseph and Esther back with us from school. Amen. Welcome them on back there. Amen. And I think just, uh, what was that, a week or two ago, we did Jacob. Remember? Actually, that was last week. Are you holding on to God? Remember we talked about wrestling with God. Yeah. You know, me and Iggy were having a little fun up here for you, right? <laughs> are we holding on to God in faith, right? Clinging on to him, or are we wrestling him in fear? Wrestling to get our way versus his way. And so this is huge because either we're surrendered to God's will, or we're trying to dominate Almighty God. You got to think about who's going to win that one. Amen? And so today we're going to examine the life of another individual that really helped us in our walk with God. Joseph, the son of Jacob. Make sure you're there in Genesis 39 here. And um, you know, in my opinion, as I said, Joseph was one, probably one of the most patient and faithful men I've seen in the Bible. Being that God wanted to teach Jacob, his father, to be surrendered to his will. I believe God decided to extend that lesson to his son Joseph as well in order to build his faith. Now, just to give you a little bit of a background here, if you study out the beginning of Joseph's life in chapter 37, you'll see that his walk with God began with dreams. Dreams that neither he or his family could understand. And so his brothers actually became jealous of him. Are you with me, right? Because his dreams made it seem like they would now be subject to him. And he was a young guy. 
Are you with me here? Yeah. So he's having these dreams like, you're going to be subject to me. And they're like, what? I'm older than you. How dare you say that, right? And so they concocted a scheme to actually sell him into slavery. Can you imagine? Right? Your own brothers enslaving you. Right? And at this point, what's remarkable about this is that Joseph was only 17 years old. 17 years old, sold into slavery. And now, mind you, I truly believe in our teen ministry. Amen, guys? I know we have, we've been having some teen Bible talks going on. I think there are like 26 visitors this week at that teen Bible talk in Balaji group. Amen, guys? And so we pray for Abigail. She's a teen, too. Yes, yes, it's amazing. If you look at teens in the Bible, um, God used teenagers powerfully. Are you with me? So if you're a little older than that, then you need to be like, wow, I need to be convicted. If teens can be used to do that, what should I do? I'm in my 20s or 30s. Are you with me? Um, but, you know, it's powerful seeing Joseph baptized, seeing Esther baptized, seeing Kaimi baptized. Like, guys, can you imagine at such a, such a young age what Joseph must have felt being sold into slavery at 17 years old? Um, it would have been easy to feel like his family had turned their backs on him, and that God had abandoned him, yeah. right? But that was not the heart of Joseph. Let's read together. Genesis 39, starting in verse 1. Now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt. Potiphar, an Egyptian who was one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him there. The Lord was with Joseph, and he prospered. See, when the Lord's with you, you're going to do great. And he lived in the house of his Egyptian master. When his master saw the Lord was with him, and that the Lord gave him success in everything he did, Joseph found favor in his eyes and became his attendant. Potiphar put him in charge of his household. Wow. So he, gets, he goes from being a slave to now being what? In charge of the entire household. Right? It says here, and he entrusted to his care everything he owned. From the time he put him in charge of his household, of all that he owned, the Lord blessed the household of the Egyptian because of Joseph. The blessing of the Lord was on everything Potiphar had, both in the house and in the field. So he left in Joseph's care everything he had with Joseph in charge. He did not concern himself with anything except the food he ate. Let's keep reading. Now Joseph was well built and handsome. Hey, man, you know, that brothers, you got to stay well built and handsome. I mean, if handsome, you may not be able to do much about, but you can be well built. <laughs> no, actually, if you, if you fall, let me, let me stop. Let me stop. <laughs> so Joseph was well built and handsome. Now, see, the problem here is that when you're well built and handsome, what temptation can come? Let's read. Now, Joseph was well built and handsome. And after a while, his master's wife took notice of Joseph. And said, come to bed with me. Well, hopefully she didn't say it like that. Maybe she said, come to bed with me. <laughs> Verse 8. Now remember now, how old is Joseph? 17 years old. Verse 8. But he refused. With me in charge, he told her. My master does not concern himself with anything in the house. Everything he owns, he is entrusted to my care. No one is greater in this house than I am. That would include the wife, by the way. His master has withheld nothing from me except you, because you are his wife. How then could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? And though she spoke to Joseph day after day, he refused to go to bed with her or even be with her. Come on, Joseph. Verse 11. One day, he went into the house to attend to his duties, and none of the household servants was inside. See, that's why you got to be careful about being alone yeah. with people. Okay. Verse 12. She called him by the cloak and said, come to bed with me. But he left his cloak in her hand and ran out of the house. When she saw that he had left his cloak in her hand and had run out of the house, she called the household servants. Look, she said to them, this Hebrew has been brought to us to make a sport of us. He came in here to sleep with me, but I screamed. Hold on a second. Wouldn't they have noticed the scream? It says here that you call the household servants. So, so how could you call your household servants and say, hey, and I screamed? 
When, when did you scream? Is that before you called us here or after you called So she's totally lying. Verse 15. When he heard me scream for help, he left his cloak beside me and ran out of the house. She kept his cloak beside her until his master came home. Then she told him this story. That Hebrew slave who brought us came to me and to make sport of me. But as soon as I cried for help, he left his cloak beside me and ran out of the house. When his master heard the story, his wife told him, saying, This is how your slave treated me. He burned with anger. Joseph's master took him and put him in prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined. But while Joseph was there in prison, the Lord was with him. He showed him kindness and granted him favor in the eyes of the prison warden. So the warden put Joseph in charge of all those held in the prison, and he was made responsible for all that was done there. The warden paid no attention to anything under Joseph's care because the Lord was with Joseph and gave him success in whatever he did. And the church said, Amen. Amen. Wow. Point number one. Be excellent no matter the reward. Be excellent no matter the reward. You know, I read this passage and, you know, there's so much here. But did Joseph get depressed by being sold into slavery? Did he stop saying, you know what, I'm not going to give my best to God anymore? Did he lose faith in God and stop obeying him? No. 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 Did he have the church around him? No. Did he have people calling him and say, hey, Joseph, how you doing? I want to I wanna get together for our, our weekly membership time. No. No. How do you do when you're all alone? You know, I thank God for the church that we have discipling partners. We are a discipling movement. What does that mean? That means that we obey Matthew 28. When it says, go make disciples, baptize them, and what? Teach them to obey everything Jesus commanded. You know, most churches, you go to church, you come, you listen, and you leave. And then you come back next week. There's no one in your life holding you accountable, praying together with you, spurring you on towards loving your deeds. That's why Jesus and I disciples two by two in Mark 6, 7 and Luke chapter 10, verse 1. He said not two by two for a reason. Because he knows you need a partner in the gospel. Even the police understand this. At least the police where I'm coming from. They're always in pairs. And so, as Christians, we got to be grateful for that. we got to be grateful that the people in our lives that want to help us be better for God. Right? And if you're a guest here and don't understand what I'm talking about, then you come to the right place. Because that's the way church is supposed to be. Are you with me right here, guys? But what's powerful about this is that Joseph didn't have anybody. There was no discipling partner. There's no one in the house. Hey, hey, bro, are you going to continue to obey? Are you going to stay pure, bro? How's your purity this week? Are you doing good, bro? 17 years old. Guys, he held on to God, not because of any evidence that it would prove beneficial. Let me say that again. You know, sometimes we do good things because we want the benefit from it. A lot of people, apparently here in Nigeria, and I've I've, I've heard this from a lot of people, they come to church to get blessed. That's right. Okay, I'm going to go to church. This is the Lord's day. So I'm going to give God one day. And the other six, I'm going to do what I want to do. But today, I'm going to give God my, my, my time, my tithe. Because why? I want him to bless me. Mm. What do you have for me? Mm. How are you going to bless me? As if God is a genie. Rub my belly. Come, rub my belly. Come to church. Come to church, sing some nice songs, and then go home and do whatever you want to do. God is not a genie for your purpose. Yeah. We worship him because he can track us down where we stand. Right. But because of his grace and mercy, we have the privilege to worship him. Right. Are you with me here? Yeah. And so, I look at this, I'm like, wow, Joseph had a personal faith and integrity yeah. that inspires me. Yeah. See, who you are when no one's watching is who you are. Yeah. Are you with me? Does it make a difference when you come to church, you wear some nice clothes, and you think you speak in nice religious tones? Oh, God bless you. And also with you. Yes, yes. yes. Oh, so good to have you here. Yes. That false humility means nothing. Who you are when no one's watching is who you are. And so I look at this and I'm like, other people, and let's be honest, how would you have responded if you were Joseph? You're thrown into slavery. You're working for Joseph and rather for Potiphar's wife. For Potiphar and Potiphar's wife. Then, after you try to stay strong, 
God's like, whoa, he, he, does, does he deliver him from this situation? No. No, what happens? He goes to prison. Wow. Now, you think Nigerian prison is bad? How do you think Egyptian prison back in like all the way back here <laughs> was back then? Thousands of years ago. Wow. You think Nigerian prison is bad? Egyptian prison. And he's a Hebrew. He's not even an Egyptian. Wow. How do you think they would treat him in prison? Guys, other people would have been angry and questioning God, but Joseph focused on doing his best. Yeah. Be excellent, no matter the reward. Yeah. There was no reward right in front of him, but he was still excellent. Yeah. See, as I said, very often we do the right things for selfish reasons. Yeah. We've got to check our motivation for why we do what we do. Yeah. And the ironic thing is that as soon as his pursuit of excellence seemed to be yielding its rewards, right? He's doing excellent, and so what, what happens? The master says, okay, I'm going to put you in charge of the entire house, the entire household. As soon as it seems like, man, he's doing great, the Lord's lifting him up there, then guess what happens? Satan's temptation. The wife comes. She's been watching him for a while. Oh, you're handsome, well-built, you take care of yourself, right? Then now, he loses Everything. But funny enough, he loses everything because he obeyed God. Mm-hmm. If he had slept with her, he probably wouldn't have lost everything. Mm-hmm. Let me say that again. Yeah. If he had went ahead and compromised in order to please the wife, he probably would have kept his position. How often does the world try to make you compromise at your job, with your friends, in order to keep your position? What would you do? Because here now, he takes a stand for God. And what happens? He loses his job. He loses everything. I appreciate my brother Quinlan. He's taking a stand for God. A former Muslim, his dad was an imam, literally has taken a stand and said, you know what? I'm going to be a Christian. And now his family has become so, I mean, just vicious and malicious. His uncle's now saying, you know what? You had had a printmaking business here. Now you can't use our store anymore. Take your stuff out. Starts talking to his vendors that he used to be able to work with. Don't work with them anymore. Going after his mother. Oh, we want to kick you out of this house so we can get the land. Finally, sending men after him to beat him up. But our dear brother Kunle, one of the newest disciples in the legacy of the National Christian Church, has stood firm as a disciple of Jesus Christ. See, what do you stand firm? When you stand firm, you may just lose everything. But God gives you everything. And you're going to find out what happens here to Joseph in just a second. (laughs) Joseph refused to compromise his purity because of his commitment to God, even when he was falsely accused of attempted rape. And you know, this is convicting us. And I I want to meditate a little bit on this for the brothers right here. 17 years old. Joseph had gone for years without any kind of influence of family or spiritual fellowship. And at this point in his time, his hormones, let's just talk about it, was at its peak. You know, teens, I I led teen teen ministry with my wife. Well, she was my wife back then, but yeah. We led teen ministry, and we know how teens can be. Of course, we were all teens at one point. When you're at that peak, and it's intense because the possibility of sexual activity would probably have been tempting him to the extreme. But what was his heart? Genesis 39, verse 9. What does the Bible say? He says here, verse 9. At the end here, it says, How then could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? Where was his focus? God. You know the reason why you may struggle with lust and impurity? is because your eyes are not on God. Mm-hmm. Wow. Yes. Your eyes are more on what people, how people see you. I mean, let's be honest. Why do people dress the way they dress? 
Why do people put on the, the, the hair and the makeup and all that stuff? Don't get me wrong, it's nice to look beautiful, it's nice to look handsome, there's nothing wrong with that. But you know how the world can be. Yeah. Yeah. Are you with me here? Yeah. Showing way too much cleavage, way too much everything, wearing medium shirts, all this nonsense. <laughs> you know what's medium? Oh, right. <laughs> Let me explain that to the Nigerians. Um, Sme- you know there's small, there's medium, there's large, right? And sometimes brothers, when they know they're, you know, they're, they're working out, they want to put on shirts that are like a size or two smaller than what they should be wearing. Yeah. So we call them medium. It's like small and medium combined. You put it on shirts that you know, accentuate every you know, ripple or muscle in your body. Because why? Because they want women to see it. They want the attraction. They want the attention. And instead of getting attention from God, they want it from men. They want it from women. Let's be honest. That's right. We're all sexual beings, guys. Let's just let's, let's, let's be honest. Yeah. Right? But here is Joseph thinking, you know what? God's turned his back on me. Why should I even care anymore? Let me get mine. By fire, by force. <laughs> Let me get mine. Have you ever felt that way? No one else is going to care about me. No one else is going to look out for me. Let me get mine. But that was in the heart of Joseph. You know, Philippians 2, take a look at me there. How does this relate to all of us? This is, this is important, guys. This is, a, this is an important study. You know, um, how long does it take for you to lose faith and give up on God? Good question. Let me ask you again. How long does it take for you to lose faith and give up on God? Without the Bible, without fellowship, without your physical or spiritual family, how would you have done? And how are you doing now with the benefit of all those things? I think sometimes we take the kingdom, God's church, for granted. You know how many people wish they could have the fellowship we have? How many people would pay money to be able to go to therapists and psychologists? When they can come and sit down with us and use the word of God and allow the spirit of God to help them? Yeah. Are you with me? Yeah. Are you grateful for the game? Are you getting the most out of it? Are you walking into your mentorship, your discipleship time? Man, let me just get open about everything. Or does your discipling partner have to be like a dentist and go looking? Right. Right. <laughs> Consider your spiritual condition and ask yourself, if I was all alone with no one to help me, how sold out for God would I be? Wow, wow. Come on, Andrew. Philippians 2, verse 12 and 13. Let's read here. The Bible reads, Philippians 2, verse 12 and 13. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation. Who here works out? Okay. Some of y'all, all y'all need to work out. Physical exercise is good for you. Okay. I'm serious. You'll find this out as you get older. Okay. Is that the work out your salvation? Is your body going to remain fit without working out? No. What's going to happen? Your, your body will atrophy. Right? And, and so I'm not telling you, you don't have to look like, you know, Hercules. All I'm saying is that you need to stay fit. It adds years to your life. And if you want to be around to be effective for God, it's good to be fit. Right? But it says to work out. In the same way you work out. Right? You need to work out spiritually. Wow. How are your times with God? How's your Bible study? How's your prayer? I used to ask people, when does your quiet time, when does your, your devotional time wear off? You know, you have a Bible study. God, help me to be patient today. God, please help me to be pure today. You know, you're praying, you're reading your, your Bible, and then an hour later, it's like, did you even have a quiet time? I see you, like, taking double glances at her. You're yelling at this guy who cut you off on the street. When does your quiet time wear off? All right. Come on, Andrew. <laughs> Guys, we need to work on our salvation with fear and trembling, both in the presence of the church and when we're alone. Yeah. See, there's enough hypocrisy here in this country. We don't want to bring it into God's kingdom. Yeah, that's right. Who you are when no one's watching is who you are. We need to be excellent no matter the reward. I'm going to be righteous whether or not you see me. 
Amen. Amen. Come on, Andrew. You can ask my wife. Amen. Come on. Yes. She knows. You see, your family yes. knows you better than anybody else. Yeah. You want to you see how someone's really doing? Talk to their family. Yeah. Households. You want to see how people are really doing? Talk to their housemates. Now you really see. That's one of the benefits of having households. And now we really see. Uh, how are they really? Uh, okay. Right? <laughs> and so, you know, after being thrown into jail for refusing to uh, be immoral, Joseph had a choice to make. He could either become faithless and bitter or spend himself in the pursuit of excellence. You know, a dear friend of mine just fell away. Come on, Andrew. Come on, Andrew. Oh, no, no. He was an evangelist in the kingdom of God. And it's shocking to see how if you allow bitterness and faithlessness to creep into your heart, yeah. it can take you out. Yeah. It doesn't matter who you are. Yeah. We've got to be praying for our dear friend, you. Yeah. Because bitterness will defile you. Yeah. And I think for all of us, guys, we've got to see how valuable this time together is. Don't ever take this time for granted. In fellowship, fellowship. Don't just sit in your chair and look around. Be excellent. See, one of the things I do, if you notice, if you're a guest here, we actually want to get to know you. That's actually what we want to do. That's what Christians do. We love God and we love his people. And so if you're just sitting there looking around, is that loving? Is that trying to be excellent and build up God's church? No, no it's not. It's selfish. Yeah. Now, you may not know this. Then, okay, now you know. Amen. So, amen. Now you forgive me. Are you with me? Yeah. But guys, it's an effort. Yeah. Come on, Andrew. And so, for me, this is, this is huge, man. But I, I think looking at Joseph here, let's get back to, to Genesis here. Okay. Um, I'm inspired because cream always rises to the top. Those who, who can persevere through the suffering, their character will be exposed. Are you with me? Because, you know, there's a lot of flashes in the pan. There are a lot of people that look, wow, look at that guy. He's talented. He's, he seems so incredible. Wow, this guy, he's going to be awesome someday. Yeah. Uh-huh. But sometimes you have to go through suffering. Romans 5, right? Yeah. Suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance produces character. You do not know who a person is until they go through suffering. What Kona is going through right now, he's showing me a lot. There's a ten different reasons why he could have been falling away from God right now. But he's standing firm, and I'm very proud of you, my brother. Very proud of you. Yes, you need to clap for him, brother. He's going through some like, it's not quite first century persecution, but it is getting close. Yeah. It's getting close. Um, let's take a look here. Because just as he continues to rise to the top, we're going to find out that another major disappointment was on the way. How many hits can you take in the battle for righteousness? Let's take a look here, guys. Genesis chapter 40. Genesis chapter 40. It says here in verse 1. Sometime later, now mind you, where is Joseph? Prison. He's in prison. Right? First he was in slavery with part of his house, but you know, he rose up, didn't have sex with the wife, got thrown into prison. Now funny enough, I honestly believe that maybe the master kind of knew that his wife was lying. Yeah. I, I, I think his wife, because I'll be honest with you, this guy was the captain of Pharaoh's guard. <coughs> this guy could kill him like that. So, I don't know. I mean, scholars have different perspectives, but I believe that just maybe he sent him to prison instead of killing him. 
because he knew his wife was lying. Because honestly, I mean, the guy could have killed him on the spot. Yeah. He was like, like, I don't know what kind of, what would you, he's the captain of Pharaoh's guard. I mean, he could have done anything. Yeah. Right? But he sends him to prison. Okay, well, now he's in prison. Does he get bitter and sad and go hang out in a corner and moan and whine? Yeah. No. He continues to do well, and now he continues to be now in charge of all of the prison. Oh my gosh. Verse 40. Chapter 40, rather. Sometime later, the cupbearer and the baker of the king of Egypt offended their master, the king of Egypt. Pharaoh was angry with his two officials, the chief cupbearer and the chief baker, and put them in custody in the house of the captain of the guard. In the same prison where Joseph was confined. That's interesting. You know, I haven't noticed that before. He says he put them in custody in the house of the captain of the guard. In the same prison where Joseph was confined. So the prison must have been somewhere on the property of the, um, the captain of the guard's house. Wow. That's interesting. So maybe he didn't send him to like the wicked, wicked prison, but he sent him to a prison on his well, You know, you, you read stuff and all of a sudden it kind of hits you. Right. So that's pretty neat. But take a look at this, verse 4. The captain of the guard assigned them to Joseph. <laughs> this is the same captain of the guard that sent him to prison. Now assigns these guys who have offended Pharaoh to him, and he attended them. <coughs> After they've been in custody for some time, each of the two men, the cupbearer and the baker of the king of Egypt, who were being held in prison, had a dream the same night, and each dream had a meaning of its own. When Joseph came to them the next morning, he saw that they were dejected. So he, he really didn't care about that because he had his own issues of his own, right? No. <laughs> Is that what the Bible says? No. <laughs> I'm making sure you're paying attention right there. Are you with me? But do you notice? What is Joseph doing? He's in prison. Hey Amen. He's at a higher rank of prison, but he's still in prison. He's attending to these guys, and he notices, oh, they're dejected. Imagine. If you were bitter, you'd be like, so what if you're dejected? I'm dejected too. I'm here in prison. I ain't do nothing. I'm talking to righteous. Dejected. You stay dejected. I'm going here and test my business. But what does he do? He cares. What? The heart on this guy. So he asked Pharaoh's officials who were in custody with him, see, they're in custody with him, right, in his master's house. Why are your faces so sad today? Wow. Do you ask questions in fellowship? Do you even want to care? Or are you more concerned about what issues you're dealing with? Verse 8. We both had dreams, they answered. But there's no one to interpret them. Then Joseph said to them, Do not interpretations belong to God? That's also important. Yeah. Seems like a lot of people think interpretations belong to them today. Yeah, that's true. But that's a whole nother sermon. I'll leave that one alone. <laughs> now, of course, <laughs> amen. Tell me your dreams. So the chief cupbearer told Joseph his dream. He said to him, In my dream, I saw a vine in front of me, and on the vine were three branches. As soon as it budded, it blossomed, and its clusters ripened into grapes. Pharaoh's cup was in my hand, and I took the grapes and squeezed them into Pharaoh's cup and put the cup in his hand. Verse 12. This is what it means, Joseph said to him. The three branches are three days. Within three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head and restore you to your position, and you will put Pharaoh's cup in his hand, just as you used to do when you were his cupbearer. But when all goes well with you, remember me. And show me kindness. Mention to Pharaoh, and get me out of this prison. For I was forcibly carried off from the land of the Hebrews, and even here, I've done nothing to deserve being put in a dungeon. Verse 16. When the chief baker saw that Joseph had given a favorable interpretation, he said to Joseph, Oh, I too had a dream. <laughs> On my head were three baskets of bread. In the top basket were all kinds of baked goods for Pharaoh, but the birds were eating them out of the basket on my head. Verse 18. This is what it means, Joseph said. The three baskets are three days. Within three days, Pharaoh will lift off your head and hang you on a tree. And the birds will eat away your flesh. You know, they're looking for a good interpretation. Probably not what he wanted to hear right there. Verse 20. Now the third day was Pharaoh's birthday. Amen. The school started on Isaiah's birthday this week. And he gave a feast for all his officials. Oh, his, uh, his, um, 
who says the 21st birthday? Where is he? Where's Archie? Oh, okay. Archie celebrates the 21st, so when you see him, encourage him, amen? Now, the third day was Pharaoh's birthday, and he gave a feast for all his officials. He lifted up the heads of the cupbearer and the chief baker in the presence of his officials. He restored the chief cupbearer to his position so that he once again put the cup in Pharaoh's hand, but he hanged the chief baker just as Joseph had said to them in his interpretation. Verse 23. The chief cupbearer, however, did not remember Joseph. He forgot him. Wow. Wow. All right, well, be excellent no matter the reward. Point number one, point number two, be faithful no matter the obstacles. Be faithful no matter the obstacles. Okay, what's going on here? Joseph's faith was not based on what others could do for him. His faith was completely in God. This is big, guys, because a lot of people go to church. Oh, pastor, pastor, does he have the gifts of healing? Oh, I want to go here. I just realized that, did you just hear about like a church falling on people recently? Yeah. It wasn't who you say though, I forget which, which state it was. Uh, Is it Bible? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. It's very sad. A lot of people just follow people to get stuff out of stuff. Yeah, get stuff from them. You know? I want a blessing, I want a miracle. Are you following God or are you following people? Come on, Andrew. Are you with me here? Joseph's faith was not based on what others could do for him. His faith was based in God. And so Honestly, you see what happened here. He interpreted the dreams. He cared enough about these guys who were dejected to want to help them. Right? One, who should have remembered him after being set free, totally forgot about him. Now, when now would you have said, you know what, I don't know if I want to be faithful anymore. I mean, I, I even looked out for these guys. Come on, God. Here I am. I'm in prison. I even cared enough about these guys to ask them how they're doing. I asked them for one remember me to Pharaoh. And he can't even do that. Anyway, we're, we're about to read in chapter 41. Two years pass before anything even happens. And you know, this is powerful because I think, you know, Romans 8, 28 talks about in all things God works for the what? The good of those who love him, who've been called to his purpose, right? Yeah. Do our convictions weaken because of the actions of others? Because, you know, sometimes we can go up and down like a thermometer because of what other people do. Yeah. <coughs> you! You caused me to sin! No, no, no. Actually, you sinned. Yeah. And when you stand before God, you're going to have to take responsibility for why you retaliated yeah. and why you acted the way you did. You can't say, no, he did this to me. She did this to me. When you stand before God, he's not going to be like, oh, really? Mm. Would you like to know what people did to me? Wow. <laughs> Would you like to know? Should I have a Should I? I, I could have called, what, 60,000 angels, 12 legions. One word, Michael, come. Never called them. Never called them. Honestly. I, I, I wish I could find a painting that, that would show the angels in heaven just waiting to be unleashed during the time of Jesus' uh, torture and crucifixion. Yeah. But yet, you just see him like holding them back. And they're like, they're like weeping and crying, and they're just, their swords are ready. They just, just say the whisper, the word. And yet, Jesus is just looking up at them and saying, No. If I could find a pen, that would be, be flight inspiring right there. Yeah. Because that's, I mean, that, that's the power of God. And yet he's like, nope, they will continue to beat me and I will continue to suffer for people who don't even really care. Wow. I'm looking forward to hearing Kate share community for community today. Amen, my sister. Hey. But do your convictions weaken because of the actions of others? Again, Joseph could have lost his faith because the cupbearer, the guy that he's helping, forgot. Has anyone ever forgot to do things for you? Yeah. How did you react? Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh -huh. Right? How about this? Do your convictions weaken even when disciples hurt your feelings? Oh, 
Even when disciples do things like that. <gasps> You're a disciple! You should know better! How could you do that? You see, when, when disciples hurt you, it's like, <gasps> it almost hurts more, doesn't it? Yeah. Actually, it does hurt more. Let's just talk about it. Are you with me here? Does that seal your faith? Or do you say, you know what, listen, we just got to be patient to help our brother and sister. Teach correct, rebuke if necessary, amen. amen. But God never stops working for those who are committed to him. And being uptight and unsurrendered is a poor choice when God has promised in Romans 8, 28, in all things he's working for the good. In all things, he's working for the good. Amen. You know, the situation that we just had recently with Shioma, our dear sister, amen. God has worked. God has worked. We have had enemies, sadly, against this church. People claiming that we're, I mean, it, it was shocking to hear the lies and the slander that people at this own complex, the manager of this complex was literally saying to try to incite Chioma's family, she incite the police against us. But you know what's amazing? In all things, God works for the good of those who love him. You know why? Because then, next thing you know, we talk to the director. The director above the manager now contacts us. Next thing you know, uh-huh. That big, well, I, I would have to explain the whole story. We don't have time for it today. But now the manager gets disciplined. The sister's intercom gets fixed. The guy who let, who let people in gets sacked. See, God works even through persecution. And now our sisters are more protected than they were before. Amen. Are you with me here? Guys, I'm telling you, you know, when stuff happens, I'm like, amen, God. In all things, God works for the good of those who love him and have been called to his purpose. And, you know, I don't know about you, but that helps me to be joyful and helps me to be at peace. Because if you're, if you're really faithful, you'll be in peace. Um, if things don't happen the way you plan or the way you would like, do you stress and freak out? Are you one of those control freaks? Right? Or you just not care and just like whatever. Both of those things are wrong. Right, guys? And so, take a look at me and have a quick I want to show you something real cool here. This is one of my favorite scriptures. I know you know it. Come on. See, God's plan is obvious. You know, there are times where he will prune God's church to become more fruitful. And they're going to they're, they're gonna have to be maybe one or two other people. I'm going to have to take off the membership because they're not being true disciples. And that's okay. Because if people aren't willing to be surrendered to God's plan, but they want to glorify themselves, amen. You can't be in God's church. You can't be in God's kingdom. I would not be a proper shepherd of God's people if I allow double standards to go on in the church. And so here in Habakkuk chapter 3, you've got to ask yourself, when there's nothing happening, when everything you poured into things, is, is, there's nothing going on, how do you stay faithful? How do you stay positive? The Bible says here in Habakkuk chapter 3, verse 17, it says, though the fig tree does not bud, and there are no grapes on the vines, though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food, Though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God, my Savior. Is so that the way you feel? You know, I've been inspired by this church. I've been so inspired by this church. God has blessed our faith to see 46 baptisms since June. Amen. That is to God be the glory. Are you with me right now? Since June, guys. My faith is not in the baptisms. Yeah. My faith is in God. Yeah. Are you with me? Yes. This is very important. People want to see miracles in order to inspire them. No, they need to get, they need to get inspired from God's word. Amen? Amen? And so, for us today, let's close out here. The last one is simply, ta-da, thanks. Be patient no matter the weight. Be patient no matter the weight. Let's get back to Genesis here. You know, um, the title of the message is Flourishing in the Face of Famine, right? Yeah. And this is convicting because if you look in Genesis, we're going to look in Genesis chapter 41 here. What do we see? Well, 
In Genesis chapter 41, two years, full years, two full years pass. And it's not until this time that all of a sudden the cupbearer remembers. Let's read. When two full years had passed, Pharaoh now had a dream. He was standing by the Nile, when out of the river there came up seven cows, sleek and fat, and they grazed along the reeds. After them, seven other cows, ugly and gaunt, <laughs> came up out of the Nile and stood beside those in the riverbank. And the cows that were ugly and gaunt ate up the seven sleek, fat cows. Then Pharaoh woke up. He fell asleep again and had a second dream. Seven heads of grain, healthy and good, were growing on a single stalk. After them, seven other heads of grain sprouted thin and scorched by the east wind. The thin heads of grain swallowed up the seven healthy full grains. Then Pharaoh woke up. It had been a dream. In the morning, his mind was troubled. So he sent for all the magicians and wise men of Egypt. Sadly, there are a lot of magicians calling themselves ministers here in Nigeria today. Pharaoh told them his dreams, but no one could interpret them for him. Then the chief cupbearer said to Pharaoh, Today I am reminded of my shortcomings. Pharaoh was once angry with his servants, and he imprisoned me and the chief baker in the house of the captain of the guard. Each of us had a dream the same night. Each dream had a meaning of its own. Now a young Hebrew was there with us, a servant of the captain of the guard. We told him our dreams, and he interpreted, interpreted them for us, giving each man the interpretation of his dream. And things turned out exactly as he interpreted them. I was restored to my position, and the other man was hanged. So Pharaoh sent for Joseph, and he was quickly brought from the dungeon. When he had shaved and changed his clothes, he came before Pharaoh. Wow. Can you imagine? In the dungeon... I don't know when the last time I took a bath, I had to shave, clothes, nasty, smelly. And yet, he was excellent and he was faithful. Amen. Verse 15. Pharaoh said to Joseph, I had a dream, and no one could interpret it, but I heard it said of you that when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. And then from there, he goes on to explain the dream to him again. Verse 25. Then Joseph said to Pharaoh, The dreams of Pharaoh are one and the same. God has revealed to Pharaoh what he's about to do. The seven good cows are seven years. And the seven good heads of grain are seven years. It is one and the same dream. The seven lean, ugly cows that came up after are seven years. And so are the seven worthless heads of grain scorched by the east wind. They are seven years of famine. It is just as I said to Pharaoh. God has shown Pharaoh what he's about to do. Seven years of great abundance are coming throughout the land of Egypt. But seven years of famine will follow them. Then all abundance in Egypt will be forgotten, and the famine will ravage the land. The abundance of the land will not be remembered, because the famine that follows it will be so severe. The reason the dream was given to Pharaoh in two forms is that the matter has been firmly decided by God, and God will do it soon. Verse 33, and now, let Pharaoh look for a discerning and wise man to put him in charge of the land of Egypt. Let Pharaoh appoint commissioners over the land to take a fifth of the harvest of Egypt during the seven years of abundance. They should collect all the food of these good years that are coming and store up the grain under the authority of Pharaoh to be kept in the citadel cities for food. This food should be held in reserve for the country to be used during the seven years of famine that will come upon Egypt so that the country may not be ruined by the famine. The plan seemed good to Pharaoh and his officials. So Pharaoh asked them, can we find anyone like this man? One in whom is the Spirit of God? The Pharaoh said to Joseph, Since God has made all this known to you. You see how Joseph always acknowledged God? Since God has made all this known to you, there is no one as discerning and wise as you. You shall be in charge of my palace. And all my people are to submit to your orders. Only with respect to the throne will I be greater than you. So Pharaoh said to Joseph, I hereby put you in charge of the whole land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh took his signet ring from his finger, put it in Joseph's finger. He dressed him in robes of fine linen, put a gold chain around his neck. He had him ride in the chariot as his second in command. And men shouted before him, make way. Thus he put him in charge of the whole land of Egypt. Be patient. No matter the weight. That's awesome. Come on, Joseph. That's, is that pretty awesome? 
Yeah. Is that for us? When would you have said, you know what? I am done. I'm done. I'm tired of waiting. I'm tired of waiting for a spouse. I'm tired of waiting for a job. I'm tired of waiting to be to just, to just to hold on to God's promises. I'm done. Come on, bro. You know, when I read about Joseph, I, I think about the Joseph principle here. Is doing what's right with or without rewards. Mm-hmm. Does he say, Pharaoh, choose me. Am I not the most discerning and wise? Oh, yeah. Look at what I've done. Check out my CV. Yeah. <laughs> Look at what I have done. Yeah. Is that what he says? No. He says, no. Even here, he was surrendered to the will of God. He says in verse 33, and now let Pharaoh look for a discerning and wise man and put him in charge of Egypt. Even there, he surrendered his life, his his situation to the hands of God. Do we often try to fight to get our way? Fight to push ourselves up? What does the Bible say? Right? The Lord will lift up the humble. That's right. He will raise up the humble, but the prideful, he'll take down. You know, for me here today, guys, you know, I I realize that Joseph didn't serve to gain promotions. He served only to please God. How about you this morning? You know, um, let's close out here in Colossians chapter 1. You know, uh, I hope this has been inspiring for you. Amen. And to think about your life. To think about what God has done. Turn over to Colossians chapter 1. In order to trust God and be patient, we got to remember that God's patience means salvation. Yeah. If God wasn't patient with us, we would not be allowed to live in our sin. But he wants all men to come to a knowledge of him and serve him. In Colossians chapter 1, the Bible says here, in verse 9... It says, for this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you and asking God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all spiritual wisdom and understanding. And we pray this in order that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and may please him in every good way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, so that you may have great endurance and patience and joyfully giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the kingdom of light. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness, and brought us into the kingdom of the Son He loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Why do we go out there and share our faith? Why do we go out there and stay strong? It's because at the end of our days, the only thing that's going to matter is whether we get to heaven and how many friends can get there with us. It won't matter. Everything else just won't matter. We got to be praying for Moses. We got to be praying for Abigail. Yeah. Are you with me here, guys? Decide to imitate the example of Joseph right here. A life of excellence, a life of faith, a life of patience because he trusted God. That is a life that flourishes even within the famine. You know, um, there's a quote that's been on my heart ever since I arrived here in Lagos. It's uh, stated by. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. back in 1963. And it's during the time of the Civil Rights Movement. And it states, the ultimate measure of a man or the ultimate measure of a woman is not where he stands in moments of comfort and convenience, but where he stands at times of challenge and controversy. The ultimate measure of a man is not where he stands in moments of comfort and convenience, but where he stands at times of challenge and controversy. I pray that when God measures our lives, we too will stand the test as well. Thank you, and God bless you.